In this tutorial, we're going to look at atomic structure and compounds. First aim is describe how electrons are arranged in shells and link this idea to the reactivity of an atom. Then briefly describe how electrons are involved in compound formation. And then finally explain the evidence for atomic structure. Now, so far, you're aware that the atom is made of three particles. We have protons and neutrons in the middle in the nucleus, and we have electrons whizzing around the outside in shells. What you'll have a less clear idea about is the scaling of the atom. And when you understand this, the atom becomes truly amazing. So before we start, here's some of the most interesting questions I think you could ask about the atom. Firstly, how big is the atom? Well, I could explain this to you in two ways. The first way is to say that 5,000 billion atoms can actually fit onto the head or the tip of a needle. And that's pretty amazing, but let's think of it another way. Let's zoom inside the orange, okay, and go near the pip. Now, obviously, the pip doesn't represent the size of an atom. Truthfully, I can't draw anything small enough to represent an atom in this orange, but imagine this dot, for an example, is the size of an atom. Though, in truth, it'd be much smaller. Now, obviously, the atom is the building block from any type of matter, so this orange would be loaded with these atoms everywhere, making it up. So here's an interesting way to think about it. What would happen if I blew this atom up to the size of an orange pip? In fact, I blew every atom up in the orange to the size of this orange pip. How big would the orange get? The orange would be the size of the Earth. Now, when you consider that the Earth is 12,000 kilometers wide, that would be incredibly large. This also means if I filled the Earth with orange pips, so there's nothing else I could fit in there, there would be the same number of orange pips in the earth as there would be atoms in an orange. Basically, atoms are absolutely tiny. Next, let's look at how big the nucleus is. Now imagine an atom is the size of a grape. Now let's imagine I could zoom inside that grape. Would the nucleus be the size of a grape seed? Well, no, it'd be much, much smaller. Now when you consider in most drawings they show the nucleus to be very large, it can be very misleading. So truthfully, in the grape example, the nucleus would be invisible. If you blew the grape up to the size of a house, then the nucleus would just be about visible. But imagine we put that grape in a football stadium and then enlarge the grape so it was the size of the football stadium. Then the nucleus would be the size of a marble and it would be clearly visible. The nearest electron would be whizzing around the outside of that grape along the perimeter. So inside, you'd have nothing but completely empty space. Believe it or not, an atom is 99.9% .9 space, and therefore you are made of 99.9% .9 space, which raises some very interesting questions. Why can't you see through people? Why can't you put your hands through people? If you want to know the answer, electrons have a negative charge, so if you put two atoms near each other, the charge on the electrons will repel each other. Similarly, the nucleus of one atom will repel the positively charged nucleus of another atom. The interesting consequence of this means that we don't really ever truly touch something. We are actually floating right now on our seat or on our floorboards because of this force of repulsion. When you think you're touching something, what you're really sensing is the force of repulsion acting over a very tiny area on your skin. The final mind-blowing fact is how dense is the nucleus? That's a scientist's way of saying how much stuff is crammed in there. So imagine I had a box and the box was about the size of a toaster box, about one foot by one foot by one foot. Now imagine this box represented an empty nucleus. And my job was to cram this box with elephants. Now, an elephant weighs about five tons, an average male elephant, uh, or 5,000 kilograms. So, so how many elephants would I have to cram into that box for that box to have the same density as a nucleus? Well, amazingly, I'd have to cram 124 million elephants into that box. What I'm saying is if I could blow an atom's nucleus to the size of this cardboard box, it would have the same mass as this box crammed with 124 million elephants. So the nucleus is incredibly dense, packed with stuff, compared to the rest of the atom, which is more or less empty. So in summary, atoms are extremely small, the nucleus has an extremely low volume relative to the whole of the atom, atoms are therefore 99.9% .9 space, and the nucleus contains 99.9% .9 of an atom's mass. These are important facts that you'll need to apply in exams. 
So one of the most important things to understand in chemistry is how electrons are arranged in the shells of the atom. For the rest of this tutorial, we're not going to be concentrating on the protons and neutrons in the nucleus because they have got nothing to do with the reactivity of an atom. It's all to do with the electrons and where they're arranged around the nucleus in the shells. To help you understand this, I'm going to use my multi-storey car park model. So imagine your local shopping centre has a multi-storey car park, as it probably does. Now imagine on the first floor there's only capacity for two cars, whereas on every other floor, let's say there's three to four floors, every other floor can take up to eight cars. Now realistically, if you were trying to park here, uh, you'd probably fill the first floor first before moving to the next floor. So the first floor takes two cars, and when this floor is filled, then cars will move to the next floor, which can take eight. So you keep moving these cars in until that level is filled. When the next level is filled, then you have to move on to the one above, until that floor is filled. The next floor can also take eight, but at the moment we've only got three cars left, so you'll just put the three cars on the final floor here. So it's pretty easy to remember, just remember the first floor can only take two, but every other floor can take up to eight. Each floor must be filled before the next one is accessed and filled up. Now in this model, each floor of the car park represents a shell that surrounds the nucleus of an atom. This is the first shell, second shell, third shell, fourth shell, etc. And each of the cars represents the electrons. Now let's put this into the real context. Um, before I continue, just keep this sentence in mind. The closer an atom is to completing its outer shell, the more reactive it becomes. So the first question is, how do you know how many electrons an atom contains? Well, you just have to look at the atomic number or the proton number, which will always be the smaller number in the periodic table. This one represents the mass, but I'm not going to be talking about these today. So the atomic number or the proton number will tell you how many protons are in the nucleus of an atom, but also they indicate how many electrons are whizzing around the outside of the nucleus. An atom will always have a balance of protons, which are positive, and electrons, which are negative. So the overall charge of the atom will always be neutral. So lithium has an atomic number of three, and therefore we have three electrons to place. Well, if you remember, shell one can only take two electrons. I always draw them as crosses. This is generally favoured in exams. And now the first shell is filled, so we have to move to the next one. So while this shell can take up to eight electrons, we only have one to give. This gives lithium an electron configuration of 2.1. This tells you how many electrons are in each shell. So the first shell has two electrons and the second shell has one. Now coming back to this sentence, remember I said the closer an atom is to completing its outer shell, the more reactive it becomes. Well, lithium has a complete shell here. If it can just get rid of that outer electron, it will have a complete outer shell and become stable. Now in losing an electron, something happens to the balance of charges. I did tell you that before, that atoms have a neutral charge because there's a balance of protons and electrons. However, if we have lost one electron, then the number of electrons changes. So now we have two electrons in the outer shell and not three. This means that the atom now has a residual or leftover charge of one positive. A charged atom is referred to as an ion. So you can have positively charged atoms, which are called cations. These are metal ions. Or you can have negatively charged ions. These are called anions, and they are non-metal ions. So now let's look at oxygen, which has an atomic number of eight. That means it has eight protons in its nucleus, but also eight electrons whizzing around the nucleus in the shells. So let's place them accordingly. Well, the first shell, as we know, can only take two electrons. And then even though the second shell can take up to eight, we only have six to distribute. Please notice how I'm actually pairing up the electrons. This is a really good technique because it makes it very easy to count the number of electrons around an atom's nucleus very quickly and accurately. So the electron configuration for oxygen atom would be 2.6 because we have two electrons on the first shell and six electrons on the second shell. Now oxygen is also a pretty reactive atom because it's fairly close to getting a complete outer shell. If it just has two more electrons, then it will become stable. So let's add those two electrons here. And now we have an oxygen ion because now we have two more electrons 
in the shells than we have protons in the nucleus, an oxygen ion has a charge of 2 minus because it's gained two negative particles. In other words, we have eight positive protons in the nucleus, but now we have 10 negative electrons outside. So there's two more negatives than there are positives, so two minus charge. Now let's do the same for chlorine, which is a non-metal which has 17 electrons outside its nucleus and obviously 17 protons in its nucleus. So once again, we put two electrons on the first shell and we can now put eight electrons in the second shell because we have plenty to go round and we still have leftovers to go into the third shell. Now, we do not have eight electrons to distribute around the final shell. We only have seven. So the electronic configuration for chlorine is 2.8.7, which means two electrons on the first shell, eight on the second shell, and seven on the third shell. By the way, just as a reminder, remember that if you have seven electrons on your outer shell, on your final shell, then you are in group seven of the periodic table. If you have one electron here, you'd be in group one, two electrons here, group two, and so on. And because you have three shells, one, two, three, you'd be in period three. Before, these two atoms, lithium and oxygen, were in period two because they only had two shells. So you might have realized by now that chlorine is one of the most reactive atoms in the periodic table because it has seven electrons in its outer shell and only needs one more to become stable. So if we give it that one more, it has a complete outer shell, but it obviously becomes an ion as well. Chlorine will become an ion with a one minus charge because it's gained one electron and therefore has one more electron negative charge than protons in its nucleus. In other words, it has 17 positively charged protons in its nucleus and when it forms an ion, it has 18 electrons outside. So, so far we've looked at a group one element, lithium, a group six element, oxygen, a group seven element, chlorine. Now let's look at a group eight or also known as group zero um, element, argon. Now I'm going to distribute the electrons just as before. So the first shell of an argon atom has two electrons, the second shell has eight, and the third shell also has eight. So what this means is firstly argon's in group eight and period three, because three shells and the outer shell has eight electrons. But more interestingly, argon is completely unreactive because it has a complete outer shell. For this reason, you cannot get an argon ion because it will not lose or gain any electrons. It's completely happy with its complete outer shell. So hopefully you understand now how electrons are arranged around an atom and why certain atoms are more reactive than others. I'm just going to remind you that hydrogen and helium are the only atoms in the periodic table which only have one shell. So just remember the rules for that. Hydrogen simply needs to gain an electron or lose this electron to have a stable atom. Generally speaking, hydrogen atoms lose their outer electron, which gives them a charge of 1 plus because they have one proton in the nucleus and now no electrons outside. And helium atoms are in group 8. Even though they don't have 8 electrons on their outer shell, they do have a complete outer shell. So maybe it's better to think of group 8 as group 0 or group circle because they have a complete outer shell. This is why helium does not react with anything. So now you can describe how electrons are arranged in shells and link that to reactivity. First aim done. So now let's look at the role of electrons in making compounds. You see, in order to gain a complete outer shell and become stable, atoms can do the following. I mean, you saw in the last section that atoms can gain electrons and give away electrons, but where do these electrons come from and where do they go to? Well, some atoms bond ionically to form ionic compounds. An ionic bond always forms between metal and non-metal ions. And more specifically, metal atoms transfer the electrons on their outer shell to non-metal atoms. So you can see this metal atom, which represents lithium, has one electron on its outer shell here. And this non-metal atom, which represents fluorine, has seven electrons on its outer shell. So they're both very close to getting a complete outer shell. All that li lithium needs to do is get rid of that outer electron by transferring it. So it transfers it to the non-metal atom. By doing that, it loses its outer shell and gains a complete outer shell, which was underneath. In doing that, it also becomes charged. So we have a lithium ion with a positive charge because it's lost a negative particle. Fluorine, having gained an electron, gains a charge as well. 
fluorine will pick up one minus charge because it's gained one electron. Because they have opposite charges, they will attract each other and that will form the bond. Other atoms bond covalently. This involves non-metal atoms only and what they do is share pairs of electrons. So take water for an example, which is made of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Oxygen has six electrons on its outer shell, so needs two more to become stable. Hydrogen has one electron on its outer shell, and that just needs one more. When you do covalent bonding diagrams, you do crosses on one atom and on the other one circles or dots. And they're called dot and cross diagrams, just so you can see which atom owns which electron. So to sort this problem out, all you do is make the atoms share electrons. So now you can see they each share one electron pair, and these electrons count for both of them. So now uh, hydrogen has one, two electrons, so it's got a complete first shell, and only shell. And oxygen now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's also got a stable, complete outer shell. What's really interesting is how the properties of these elements change as they react. I mean, you all know that hydrogen is an explosive gas and oxygen is a gas that basically is required for fires. But when you react them together to make water, water is a liquid that actually puts out fires. Pretty magical when you think about it. So there are three types of compounds. Uh, the first one are simple covalent molecules. So these are very simple molecules like carbon dioxide, which we breathe out, and water vapor, which we also breathe out. They're simple because they have a finite shape. They're very small molecules. Ionic compounds, however, form giant ionic lattices, which are huge sprawling um, lattices or matrices of oppositely charged ions holding each other together. Table salt or sodium chloride is an example of a giant ionic lattice. And because the ions are regularly arranged, you can see why salt has a crystal-like structure. Similarly, you can get giant covalent structures, but remember here, we haven't got electron transfer like we do in giant ionic lattices, but rather these atoms are sharing electrons. So an example of a giant covalent structure is silicon dioxide, which you may better know as sand. So if you understand that electrons can be transferred to form certain types of compounds called ionic compounds, or they can be shared to form other compounds called covalent compounds, then you can describe how electrons are involved in compound formation. Second aim done. Finally, and I've put this in here because I've seen this come up in exam questions as an example of applied knowledge, so I thought I'd go through this with you. What is the evidence for atomic structure? More specifically, what is the evidence for the nucleus being incredibly small and only taking up a small proportion of the atom's volume? Well, in a rather elegant experiment, which is quite an old experiment, scientists took very thin gold sheet. They got a particle emitter that shot out or fired positively charged particles, and they noticed the following. Most particles went through the sheet to the other side, which makes sense because most of an atom is empty space, but occasionally they got reflected. So, what does this mean? Well, only 1 in 20,000 particles were repelled. This proves that the volume of the nucleus is very small when compared to the overall volume of the atom. Remember, the reason why they repelled is because alike charges repel. And of course, logically, if the nucleus of an atom is much larger, then you'd expect far more collisions and repulsions. And that's explaining the scientific evidence for atomic structure. Last name done.